It's, it's good to see you all. And by all, I mean both sides. Because I've come to understand the meaning of the word all over the last three days. Where first section today, two sections we're going to look at, is called the New Calvinism. It is a distinct type of Calvinism we've made brief reference to, but we're going to talk about more today. And, and I don't know if you in the Philippines will get the opening joke or not. The, the United States, there are television programs called soap operas, which just follow the fiction stories of fictional people's lives and all that. And there's a very popular soap opera referred to as The Young and the Restless. And it's all about the lives of these young people in their 20s and so forth. Well, this is the subtitle for the New Calvinism, also known as the Young and Restless and Reformed Movement. David Hunt writes, at the time of writing of his, his institutes, Calvin, far from being an apostle like Paul, was a brand new convert to the faith who had scarcely begun to walk with the Lord. Well, I want need to discuss the new Calvinism. We'll discuss why, how it is distinct from the old Calvinism and why I think it is the most dangerous part of Calvinism. The new Calvinism is a combination of traditional Calvinism, traditional Calvinism, a charismatic view of the apostolic gifts, a charismatic view of the apostolic gifts, and the cultural perspective of the majority of millennials. Combination of traditional Calvinism, charismatic view of the apostolic gifts, and the cultural perspective of the majority of millennials. It claims historical roots while seeking to be politically and theologically correct. It is a movement that aims at building churches around young adults appealing to the young. It is not popular with the old Calvinists for more than one reason. In fact, some of the harshest critics of the new Calvinism are old traditional Calvinists because the new Calvinism is based on the idea, let's find out what the young people want and give it to them. It's not based on let's find out what they need and give it to them. It's based on let's find out what they want and give it to them. And very often, the new Calvinism is based on starting churches and drawing members out of the old Calvinist churches. And some of its strongest critics are the old Calvinists. It is also most likely to be sneaky and deceptive by saying we're not Calvinists, we're Reformed. And uh, as we'll mention this in a little bit, but the average new Calvinist preacher is probably wearing skinny jeans and a sport shirt when he preaches on Sunday morning. Because one, one of the major emphasis is, well, you shouldn't have to dress up for church. Like that's a fundamental of the faith. I don't personally don't care one way or the other what you do, but they've made it a fundamental of faith. Okay? Well, the March 12th, 2009 issue of Time magazine, this is the lost world, the unsaved world describing the new Calvinism. The March 12th, 2009 issue of Time magazine called the new Calvinism one of the 10 ideas changing the world describe the new Calvinism this way. If you really want to follow the development of conservative Christianity, track its musical hits. In the early 1900s, you might have heard the old rugged cross, a celebration of the atonement. By the 1980s, you could have shared the Jesus is my buddy intimacy of shine, Jesus, shine. Today, more and more top songs feature God who's very big, well, we are, well, hark the David Crowder band. I am full of earth, you are heaven's worth. I am stained with dirt, prone to depravity. Calvinism is back. 
Remember I told you how it went through cycles? And how when I was first in the ministry, it was going through a cycle of booming and drawing all these uh, followers. A and then it sort of died out because it killed the churches and colleges that were following it. And for about 20 years, you didn't hear that much of it. And then you have a whole nother cycle. And he's drawing all these churches and colleges. And then it drowns out again because it killed the churches and colleges that were following it. And now we're in the beginning of another phase of it. And um, that is what this uh, magazine article is calling attention to. And he said, Calvinism is back, and not just musically. John Calvin, 16th century reply to medieval Catholicism's buy your way out of purgatory excesses is evangelicalism's latest success story. Complete with an utterance, sovereign and micromanaging deity, sinful and puny humanity, and the combination's logical consequence, predestination, the belief that before time's dawn, God decided whom he would save or not, unaffected by any subsequent human action or decision. Calvinism, cousin to the Reformation's other pillar, Lutheranism, is a bit less dour than its critics claim. It offers a rock-steady deity who orchestrates absolutely everything, including illness or home foreclosure, by a logic we may not understand, we don't have to second guess. Our satisfaction and our purpose is fulfilled simply by glorifying him or by worship uh, without defining what glorifying him means or what worship means. In the 1700s, a Puritan preacher, Jonathan Edwards, invested Calvinism with a rapturous near mysticism. Yet it was soon overtaken in the U.S. by movements like Methodism, which were much more impressed with human will. Calvinist descended liberal bodies like the Presbyterian Church discovered, discovered other emphasis, while evangelicalism's loss of appetite for rigid doctrine and the triumph of the friendly, fuzzy Jesus seemed to relegate hardcore reform preaching, reformed operates as a loose synonym for Calvinism, to a few crotchety southern churches. No more. Neo-Calvinist ministers and authors don't operate quite on a Rick Warren scale, but notes Ted Olson, a managing editor of Christianity Today, everyone knows where the energy and the passion are in the evangelical world. The Time Magazine say the, the most excitement, the fastest growth, the biggest emphasis is in the new Calvinism. That is just the truth. Uh, if you have an account on Facebook, you come across it all the time. With the pioneering new Calvinist John Piper of Minneapolis, Seattle's pugnacious Mark Driscoll, and Albert Moeller, head of the Southern Seminary of the huge Southern Baptist Convention. The Calvinist flavored ESV study Bible sold out its first printing and reformed blogs like Between Two Worlds are among other cyber Christianum's hottest links. Like Calvinists, more modern evangelicals are exploring cures for the movement's doctrinal drift, but can't offer the same blanket assurance. A lot of young people grow up in a culture of brokenness Divorce, Drugs, or Sexual Temptation, says Colin Hansen, author of Young, Restless, Reformed, A Journalist's Journey with the New Calvinists. They have plenty of friends. What they need is a God, Moeller says. The movement, someone begins, the moment someone begins to define God's being or actions biblically, that person is drawn to conclusions that are traditionally classified as Calvinist. Of course, that presumption of inevitability has drawn accusations of arrogance and divisiveness since Calvin's time. Indeed, some of today's enthusiasts imply that non-Calvinists may actually not be Christians. And that is something you are hearing. We are true Christianity. You are not. Skirmishes among the Southern Baptists who have a competing non-Calvinist camp and online flame wars 
bode badly. It's interesting enough, not only is there a Calvinist versus non-Calvinist war, if you will, very, very aggressive Calvinist trying to draw people out of anything similar to, to regular Baptist positions. The Calvinists are at war among themselves between the new Calvinists and the old Calvinists. Well, differences between the new and old Calvinists. Prominent new Calvinist Mark Driscoll describes the differences between the old Calvinism and the new Calvinism this way. New Calvinism is missional and seeks to create and redeem culture. So the new Calvinism isn't trying to withdraw from the world. It's trying to transform the world. If you find old time, John MacArthur type Calvinism, there would be a lot of emphasis on being distinct from the world. Not in the new Calvinism. We're going to be right there in it and among it. And we're going to change it. We're going to be part of it and change it. New Calvinism is flooding into cities. It is, uh, I mean, and I pastored in Chicago, third largest city in the United States. I, I can't even begin to emphasize how much churches in the cities are responding to and being taken over by Calvinism. The difference between a Calvinist church in the big city and a country church or rural church is likely to be very, very dramatic. Old Calvinism was generally secessionist, believing the gifts of the Holy Spirit, such as tongues and prophecy, had ceased. And this is the thing I got to tell you that absolutely boggles my mind. The old Calvinism believed, and correctly, the apostolic gifts were temporary. They ended with the time of the apostles. The new Calvinist, at the very least, hold out the possibility that they may be for today. And you find Presbyterian churches speaking in tongues. Baptist churches speaking in tongues. And um, this is one reason the old-time Calvinists are very upset with this movement. It seems like the attempt to create a church for everybody. Got a little Calvinism here. Got a little Pentecostalism here. And, and uh, you know, we got something for everybody. Just come to us. And uh, I have called it, and again, this may not register here, Walmart Christianity. Walmart's huge department stores in the United States that advertise they have something for everybody. That's probably true at Walmart. The new Calvinist church is advertised. They got something for everybody. No matter what you're looking for, they got it. New Calvinism is genuinely continuanist. In other words, they believe gifts like tongues and healing still exist. They're genuinely, generally continuous with regard to spiritual gifts. New Calvinism is open to dialogue with other Christian positions. They very much, I, I say this very cynically, they very much want everybody's tithe. They want to say, our church is for everybody, no matter what your position is, our church is for you. At the end of the day, I think what they really mean is we want you to put your money in our offering plate. No matter who you are or what you believe or what you do. Dress. New Calvinist preachers are more often found in skinny jeans and sport shirts than suits. Because they're wanting to relate to the young people and they want the young people to feel at home. I, uh, a new Calvinist preacher that I'm acquainted with was asked to officiate a wedding and they asked, you know, wanted him to wear a suit and tie when he was doing the wedding. And he had to call me to ask, where can you get a suit and tie? Because he didn't own one. <clears throat> the ordination of women. Almost unheard of among old Calvinists, it's common among new Calvinists. 
This is accepted by the millennials. It's popular. You're going to face criticism if you don't respect the idea of women preachers. So among the new Calvinists, sure, what, whatever's popular. So the ordination of women and women preachers is very, very common among the new Calvinists when it was unheard of among the old Calvinists and still is. You won't, you won't see any ladies preaching at any of John MacArthur's big conferences. But among the new Calvinist meetings, I just guarantee you there'll be a lady preaching. Because you've got to do what's popular. I say with that, and I don't think I addressed that in the notes, most of the new Calvinists don't really believe in hell. Or if they believe in it, they don't talk about it. Because hell, the doctrine of hell, is not popular. You get the idea? You've got to appeal. You've got to appeal to the public. You have to be popular with the public. Many of them do not preach against homosexuality because in the United States that's not popular today. Some of them will still say they don't believe in homosexual behavior, but they don't believe in mentioning it from the pulpit because there'll be people you won't reach if you talk about that from the pulpit. And this is all about reaching the biggest crowd. So it's not popular today in the United States to preach about hell or against homosexuality. So you either change your position or you just don't mention the subjects. That's why I said previously, as, as big a disagreement I have with the old Calvinists, I like the old Calvinists better than I do the new ones. And what's happening in new Calvinism? Music. Virtually anything goes among new Calvinists. Rap and heavy metal are commonplace approaches to Christian music. I mean, I've known some of the old Calvinists who sang the great old hymns. They wrote some of the great old hymns. Uh, you could love their song service even if you chafed at their preaching. But not in the new Calvinism. It's got to be whatever is popular on the secular music station with the young people. I have heard music uh, called Christian music by the new Calvinist that just boggles my mind. That I just can't believe anybody called that Christian music. New Calvinists are most likely to believe in concept inspiration rather than verbal inspiration. Now this is a very big deal to them. And uh, by that, I mean they, they don't believe God inspired the words, they believe God inspired the ideas. And so the issue is not the words. Uh, that's very, very important to them because it gets them away from the King James Bible. You use whatever is the latest popular translation of the Bible because it doesn't matter. And they say nobody understands the King James and you can't reach anybody if you use the King James. And, you can't. and, and, and they're desperate to escape the influence of the King James Bible. And as a way of doing that, they've advocated the idea, God never inspired words anyway. He inspired ideas. And as long as you have the ideas, everything's okay. And they say you should express the ideas in the way that's most likely for young people to understand. So whatever the fad translation of the moment is, that's what they're using. Right now, the biggest fad translation of the moment is the English Standard Version, ESV. The editor of the ESV is himself a Calvinist. It is very much a Calvinist translation. He is an interesting man. I've actually communicated with him. He's a nice man. But he's just a big hero to them. And... Uh, Boy, the, the, 
they may approve of a hundred Bibles, different translations, but the last one they'll use is the King James Bible. And in order to justify that, they're very big on the idea of concept inspiration. And I will tell you, even though this is not how they would say it, in practice, if you believe in concept inspiration, there's always room for your ideas in a Bible translation that's based on ideas. There's always room for your ideas. The Bible is not the final authority. Public opinion. Because you're trying to be popular. The whole thing's built around being popular. Contemporary worship, a total lack of dress standards. Some good Christians debate certain things about dress standards, but the new Calvinists don't have any dress standards. Anything goes. Social training, acceptance of tobacco, Roman Catholic mysticism are all a normal part of the new Calvinism. Marijuana use is gaining acceptance as it is legalized. Because as it becomes, in the United States, as marijuana becomes more popular, more and more of the new Calvinists accept it. Because it's all about being popular. Unlike the old Calvinism, the new Calvinism is more influenced by American cultural norms, pop psychology, and American neo-evangelicals than European theologians of the past. I promise you John Calvin would not recognize the new Calvinism. Okay. Whatever we might say about John Calvin, he would have understood what was wrong with homosexuality. Yeah. And he actually did a pretty good job explaining the doctrine of scripture. And he certainly didn't believe that the apostolic gifts were for today or his day. Uh, the new Calvinism I also believe is more dangerous because it is, uh, they've captured something that you may understand that, that I'm, I'm just starting to understand. The, the form of communication today is the internet. Right. And new Calvinism is based on spreading its ideas, not through books, not through sermons, but through the internet. And many of us, my age, um, our mind just doesn't work that way. The, the internet's a little add-on to whatever we think about communication. To the new Calvinists, and they have learned how to use social media. And a um, new Calvinist friend of mine uh, has 10 different social media accounts. I didn't even know there were 10 different forms of social media. And he rattled them off, and there's more that he doesn't have. All new to me. But one thing is for sure, they have figured out how to communicate. I don't like what they're communicating, but I will say there's something for us to learn from how effective they are at communicating. And I'm not sure the people of my age are ever gonna get this. You probably already know it, but um, they, they latched onto this. This is how people think. This is how people communicate. This is how people adopt new ideas. And they learned to use the internet and left all of us, regular Baptist, old Calvinist, and everybody else behind in the use of the internet. And, and it's really been a phenomenal thing to watch I think we need to learn from it. We need to learn how to use it. We need to be very careful. In, in many of their programs, the internet replaces the local church, and that's wrong. But by the same token, their ideas are promoted primarily through the internet. And they have been very effective at it. And there's certainly things to learn from them in terms of this. Uh, I do not think you could be a new Calvinist preacher without your own web page, without your own YouTube channel. 
And um, it wasn't that long ago, I didn't know what a YouTube channel was. Um, I started getting requests to do interviews on YouTube channels, and I said, you have a YouTube channel? And it was like, doesn't everyone? I said, well, the men of my generation, for the most part, don't. But I, I'm, I'm doing about one interview on a YouTube channel a week now. And uh, this form of communication is all brand new to me, but the new Calvinist crowd has mastered it, and it is where their great influence comes from. Yeah. There are things to learn from that. There are things to be warned about from that. And um, when I was young, your age, decades ago, in another century, in another, another country, in another time, we, we had a fellow named Marshall McLuhan who uh, wrote a book called The Medium is the Message. He said, it doesn't matter what you say, it only matters how you say it in terms of people believing it. And he actually had training programs on that and I went to one of them and none of it registered with me because it's not how my mind works. But in that day, he said, if you want to be believed, you put it in a book. People believe what they read in books. You could say the same thing to them, but they're not going to get it. So it's when they see it in the covers of a book that they believe it. Well, that really may have been true. I'm talking about, I was in high school when I went to his thing, so we're talking about the 1960s, in the 1960s. Today, the medium still seems to be the message only if you want young adults to believe it, they have to read it on the internet. Yeah. The same information in a book would mean nothing. And the same information said in person would mean nothing. And the same information tragically in a sermon would mean nothing. If you want them to believe it, they have to read it, be able to read it on their phone. Right. And... Um, that, that creates all kinds of things, and I'm not the right person to, to speak to all we need to learn from that. But I will say this, we do need to learn from it. Some prominent New Calvinists, people who have influenced this movement. John Piper, known for his books and Bible conferences. I have some of John Piper's books. I was not even the least bit impressed, but, but he is the one who laid down the foundation for this and extraordinarily popular. And I know people who can quote his books in a way that you and I quote the Bible. Mark Driscoll, until recently the pastor of um, Mars Hill Church in Seattle. Now, I'd never heard of him until I was putting this lesson together. Turns out, at that time that I wrote this, his sermons were the most downloaded sermons in the history of the internet. I'd never heard of him, because I don't download sermons on the internet. I read books. My, my son and I, my son likes to taunt me about all this. He told me recently, uh, when I started doing some things with Facebook, he said, Dad, this is tremendous. He said, you've caught up to the 90s. My first thought was that was a compliment, but then I began to think about it, I don't think that really is. <laughs> I think he's telling me I'm still 30 years behind. <clears throat> I'd never heard of Mark Driscoll, but his sermons had been more downloaded on the internet than anyone in history. He is a new Calvinist and advocates this, and he especially advocates it as the way to reach the big cities. Tim Keller, pastor of Redeemer Presbyterian Church in New York City, he's a champion of the idea that only contemporary worship can reach the big city. I mean, he pushes that, does seminars on it, 
if you want to reach people in the cities, it can only be done with contemporary worship. I pastored in Chicago. I could not tell you the number of times people would visit our church and, and they would say nicely, we like your preaching and all that, but said, um, you, you, you're using hymns in the King James Bible. We can't go to a church with hymns in the King James Bible. You can't reach anybody in the city that way. And over and over again, they would quote this. I'd never heard of him before this. They'd quote this Tim Keller. They were looking for a church that had been built on the principles laid down by Tim Keller. So I did find out who he was. I disagreed with him on virtually everything. Okay. He was a Calvinist in the sense he believed the five principles of tulip theology, but he'd added all this other stuff to it. Okay. Albert Moeller, president of Southern Seminary, Seminary, largest Southern Baptist Convention seminary, he is now the leader in the Southern Baptist Convention. The Calvinists, and especially the new Calvinism, at least in the United States, have seized control of the Southern Baptist Convention. And it's utterly amazing uh, the things they're advocating and teaching. And um, the, the current leadership of the convention, Jim Greer and some of these folks, are not anything that I would recognize as a preacher. They made a big deal about how we have to accept homosexuals in our church membership, and uh, that if you're visiting a church and the pastor's wearing a tie, there's no point in ever going back because he's just a waste of time. And uh, I mean, I, I've watched a few of his sermons. I couldn't believe this guy was president of the Southern Baptist Convention. But it, it's the new Calvinism, and it is the, the essence of all of this nonsense. And uh, yeah. he, but he is the elected president of the Southern Baptist Convention. Mark Deaver, pastor of Capitol Hill Baptist Church in Washington, D.C. He was another big advocate of this. He, he's been run out of the ministry over moral scandals since I wrote this. Uh, but before that, I mean, he was just super influential in all this. The Gospel Coalition Council is an organization for the promotion of new Calvinist ideas. That is some of these well-known people coming together for the idea of promoting this as the true Christianity of the future. And I used to say this when I pastored in Chicago. I said, I would rather pastor a church of 10 people that were loyal to what the Bible had to say than I would pastor a church of 10,000 people that were practicing this new Calvinism. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Cultural relevance. The new Calvinist movement has been strong on emphasizing relevance to the modern culture relevance to the modern culture. Thus they support female ordination, rock music, and immodest dress. Their leaders have been torn over issues like the approval of homosexuality and abortion. Now we'll have to say the, the new Calvinist preacher I know the best. I'll, I'll have to say he does preach what the Bible says against homosexuality and abortion. But he takes a lot of criticism from the other new Calvinist preachers for doing that. Because they'll say, you can't reach people for Christ if you're controversial. There are still some prominent new Calvinist leaders who oppose homosexuality and abortion. However, new Calvinism is based upon appealing to millennials and the majority of millennials approve abortion and homosexuality. These positions are gaining acceptance among the new Calvinist movement. Aggressiveness. The new Calvinist holds an aggressive attitude towards proselyting from other evangelical churches that would be thought of as unseemly by Calvinists of old. I mean, they're on it. They got somebody's name and address or name and, name and their internet website information 
and, and they know they're going to a regular Baptist church or an old Calvinist church, they will be flooding them with information on the internet. <clears throat> they do not hesitate to join churches and try to change them and take them over. They do not hesitate to get involved with Bible colleges and then try to gain control of those Bible colleges. They're incredibly aggressive. Their aggressiveness matches that of the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. Now, what I'm about to say next sounds harsh, but there, there's a reason for it. I came to the point of practicing this when I pastored, and, and I've not been pastoring for the last six and a half years, but I have advised my pastor friends to this. If one of these people shows up and starts attending your church, run them off. They will be trouble. They are not there to learn. You are not going to change them. You're not going to help them. They are there to get control of your church. And my, what I've, hey, I believe in religious liberty. You want a church based on this new Calvinism business? Go build one. A few people have built large ones. That's not what normally happens. What normally happens is people take over churches that were built by other people, other principles and other doctrines. And then they run them into the ground and kill them. If you want a new Calvinist church, go build one, don't steal one. And I know sometimes people will come to a church and, and you can help them. Uh, during my time pastoring, I had some interesting people end up with me in churches that, that over a period of time we were able to help and encourage. And I had two different ladies that were ordained women preachers who came under my ministry and, and said in church and over a period of time I was able to help them see what was wrong with what they'd been doing and, and so forth. And, uh, good things came out of it. Not this crowd. They, it's part and parcel of what they believe to be extremely aggressive and to believe it's their job to take over and change churches. That I've never seen anything like the aggressiveness of the new Calvinist. So I came to the point that this is what I practiced. Somebody started attending a church, church I pastored, that believed in this stuff. I told them to go away. So that's not the doctrinal statement of our church. Your movement is famous for hurting churches. Not here, not while I'm pastor. You are not welcome here. The church I pastored in Chicago had written into the doctrinal statement of the church, that the pastor could forbid attendance to anyone. I use that. Again, I sometimes worked with, sometimes successfully, sometimes unsuccessfully, I worked with people from very, very different beliefs and background. I'm interested in helping people. I'm not the enemy of everybody that I disagree with. But this group, is amazing in their aggressiveness. So I'm, I'm just telling you what I have advised pastors. They say, yeah, we got this young couple coming in. They say, get rid of them. They will be trouble to your church, and they may be trouble to the point that they destroy your church. Okay. <clears throat> the aggressiveness matches that of the Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons. Would you let Jehovah's Witnesses attend your church and be aggressive? Okay. Some groups have that aggressiveness built in. I'm willing to try to reach anybody for the Lord. Okay. But uh, this crowd, you know what they're about. Biblical analysis. The new Calvinists misunderstood the definition and scope of the gospel. They have kept the worst of Calvinism while rejecting the contributions that Calvinists sometimes make. I made this statement several times as we're together. 
Credit where credit's due, blame where blame's due. Okay? There have been some things we've credited some Calvinists for. The new Calvinism rejects the good things that some Calvinists did and hang on to all of the bad, which makes them even more dangerous. Okay? The gospel is not limited, as both the old Calvinists and new Calvinists claim. We've already address that, but I just repeated it there. Separation from the world. Christians may have legitimate debates about what separation from the world involves. But the new Calvinists invalidate the concept completely. They don't believe in any separation. That there might be a, a realistic argument between us over what the, where the lines are, but the idea that there are no lines, there's no basis for that. Okay. Um, New Calvinism affirms that concept of worldliness. New Calvinism teaches, and there's a blank here, and it's a very important one for you to get. New Calvinism teaches the infiltration of the world rather than separation from the world. The infiltration of the world rather than separation from the world. It's extraordinarily dangerous. They teach the infiltration of the world rather than separation from the world. The charismatic gifts. The new Calvinists embraces the idea that the charismatic gifts are still in existence. But they may rarely refer to this or try to practice it in their church services. Because they understand what a mess it'll make in your church services. They want the charismatics coming. They want the charismatics tithing. But they don't really want them rolling in the aisles. They do not want to lose influence with millions of charismatics. This goes way beyond the neo-evangelicals, the way neo-evangelicals accept charismatics. The new evangelicals say we should fellowship with the charismatics, even though we think they're wrong about the apostolic gifts, we should fellowship with them anyway. The new Calvinist says, well, this is all of God. Most of our people don't practice it. Maybe it's not best to do it at church, but we think this is all of God, and, and you know, we want you to be here with us because we know you're just as much of God as we are. Sheep stealing. The aggressiveness of the new Calvinists makes them a special challenge for independent Baptist pastors. They will target your people. In Chicago, uh, I had the privilege of pastoring a church where we were blessed to see a lot of people saved. I do not believe we ever had anybody saved that some new Calvinist church did not try to steal away. They didn't win them. They didn't even witness to them. Once they found out there was a new Christian somewhere, they went after them. I could not uh, put into numbers, there were so many new converts we lost to new Calvinist churches. Their aggressiveness is just unbelievable. They will target your people. And I mean, it's not just independent Baptist. The, this, the old Calvinists don't like them because of this. They really go after their people, same way. There's a long blank, but again, I need to say this. Their savvy use of social media, their savvy or clever use of social media makes them especially effective in reaching millennials. Their savvy use of social media makes them especially effective in reaching millennials. Again, I'm not the person to give you lectures on this. It's hard for me to come 
uh, to grips with to understand the impact that we have, social media has. I'm on the board of an organization called the King James Bible Research Council. We have a yearly annual meeting, which we have a number of speakers. I help form the organization. I'm asked to speak at the annual meeting every year on the King James issue. I cannot be begin to comprehend how many people listen to these sermons on the internet. I hear from all over the world. I get invitations from all over the world from people who have heard this that people all over the world that know me that I have never met. I, I'm stunned. I mean, I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad for the opportunities. I just uh, made a trip to Australia for folks who invited me because of that. Uh, yesterday morning and this morning both, I communicated with people from South Africa, Union of South Africa, who know me from that. I am utterly amazed about how many people see those sermons on the internet. Yeah, glory to God. Um, we cannot miss the significance of this. And, and this is part of what happened during the pandemic. Uh, all of a sudden, independent Baptists noticed the internet because we didn't have any other way to put out our services. And uh, I think independent Baptists are starting to get a sense of the potential that's here and what's here and what's really going on with this. And um, again, there's a danger. Some people try to replace the local church with the internet. That's wrong, absolutely wrong. But there is something to be said for communicating through the internet that we need to know more about, learn more about. Well, the new Calvinism is one of the most influential theological fads of the moment. You notice I called it a fad. A fad is something that comes for a while and it goes away. Okay. We let people my age look back at our pictures when we were your age, the fads of how we all dressed back then, and we look at back at them and laugh because nobody would dress that way today, but it was very popular then. Those fads came and they went. Okay. I believe the new Calvinism is a fad. I do not believe it will endure but that does not mean I do not believe it is important. I believe it is probably, in terms of influencing people, the most significant religious movement out there today. And it does harm, and um, it, that all of that is tragic, and we must, must be aware of it. Okay? Let's take a break, and we'll come back and spend the next couple hours on... Uh, a study of the fruits of Calvinism from Ron Comfort. Thank you, my friends.